Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, maximum length of pair chain. We're given an array of n pairs where each pair is kind of like an interval to be honest. So if you remember or have solved any of the interval problems, this one is definitely similar. So a pair in this case is two values left and right where the left value is always going to be less than the right value. So that means every interval is actually going to have a non-zero length. Like none of them are just gonna be a point or anything thing like that. And here they kind of just give us, you know, in my opinion, an overly complicated way of wording this. But basically, they're saying that if we have certain pairs like these certain intervals like these, we say that these two intervals are chained together or whatever word they use. I, I think chain is the right one. These are chained together if the ending value of one pair. So here, pair one is this guy over here and B is the ending value of that pair. And this is P2 and here C is the beginning of pair two. So if the ending of pair one is less than the beginning of pair two, then these two, they form a chain, I guess. Now, imagine that these two intervals were equal, like if pair two actually started where the other pair ended, that does not count. So that's very important to know that this is less than, it's not less than or equal. So keep that in mind. Now, we are given the pairs in some arbitrary order where there's no guarantee that these are going to be sorted in any particular order. So our job here is basically among all of the pairs and some of them, who knows, could overlap each other. We could have a bunch of pairs. Our ultimate goal is basically to figure out what is the longest chain that we can form. Now, in this very kind of simplified example where there's like four pairs, it looks like this would be the longest chain and there would be two pairs that form it. We can't really include this because it overlaps them. Can't include this one either because it also overlaps them. So the premise of the problem is not super complicated once you actually understand it. Now, there are actually two solutions. I'll briefly discuss the first one, which is going to be the dynamic programming solution. I'll just put DP for short and you could also solve it recursively with a memoization. And that solution is gonna be big O of N squared. And I'll kind of briefly discuss why that is basically going to be the longest increasing subsequence algorithm. You might already know why that's the case if you've solved this problem before. And the second solution is actually a very simple one. If you've solved a lot of the interval related problems, you might be able to figure it out. It's basically just sort the input. And that actually allows us to, after we sort the input, we can just scan through the list of intervals or a list of pairs in this case. We can do that scan in big O of n time. But of course, we know that the bottleneck in that case is going to be from the sorting, which is typically n log n. So I'll quickly go over the first solution, dynamic programming, the longest increasing subsequence, where we basically brute force this. We try to come up with every valid chain, like we literally try to create every possible chain using recursion. And when we do that, we can then apply caching. And that's the recursive way to solve this problem in big O of n squared. And then of course, if you're familiar with dynamic programming, you can optimize it. Well, not necessarily optimize it, but you can do it the tabulation method. That's what I usually call the true dynamic programming solution. But quickly to give you the intuition for that, it's pretty much exactly like the LIS algorithm. So if you're interested to see the implementation, if you can solve that problem, I guarantee you can solve this one because the only difference is with the longest increasing subsequence, we're given a sequence of numbers like maybe one, two, one, three, two, four. And we want to find the longest sequence of increasing numbers, which I think in this case is gonna be one, two, three, four. And that's four numbers. And the way we would be able to determine that recursively is by making a decision tree. So for every number, we would make a choice. We either include one or we skip one. And then for the second number, we make the same choice in both branches. We include two or we skip two. Here, we also make the same choice, include two or skip two. And then here we would make the third choice, but actually we're not allowed to make that choice in this case because we chose two. If we were to choose one here, clearly this subsequence would not be in increasing order. So that's kind of the idea here. And what you would find if you implemented this is 
with this recursion, we would actually be keeping track of two variables. One is pretty obvious, the index that we're currently at. So here we're at index zero, here we'd be at index one, here at index two. And the second value might not be super intuitive, but as I kind of mentioned, we do care what the previous value was because that does influence which elements we can choose next. Like here down this branch, we see we didn't even choose anything here. So technically we are allowed to include the one here, but here we definitely can't include the one we have to skip it we can't even have two branches here because we don't have a choice to make so that's longest increasing subsequence now how does that apply to this problem well what we could do is sort these pairs by the starting value because we are still technically trying to brute force this and here you can see that the intervals are already sorted by start value and the only main difference here between the regular LIS algorithm would be we have two values to compare. So instead of just having like a one and a two here and just checking that uh, these values are in increasing order, comparing pairs is a tiny bit more complicated because with the first pair, we would look at the last value, the second value. And the pair after that, we would look at the first value and that's what we would compare. We would compare the end of P1, like pair one, compare that with the start of p2 that's really the only difference here and that's also why we are sorting this based on the start time because if we do that we are able to iterate over the list of pairs because remember the pairs are not given in any particular order now that's kind of the big o of n squared solution i'm pretty sure it does pass for this problem though that's not what i implemented because there actually is a more simple and also more efficient approach if we can sort but this time we're sorting a bit differently and before i even get into why we're going to do that let's look at the picture and i'm going to try my best to convince you why why this algorithm works before I even show you the algorithm. Suppose we have three intervals like this. If I were to draw them out, they might look like this, where this interval is going to be clearly the longest one. It's also the one that starts first. It starts at one. This interval is two, three. It's shorter. It starts after this one, but it also ends earlier. And we also then have this interval, four, five. Let's say that goes from here. To here. What we're trying to figure out here is can we solve this by just making a single pass through the list of intervals? We don't necessarily know how we're going to sort them, how we're going to arrange them, but is it even theoretically possible that we could do it in a single pass? What that means is we can at most just compare adjacent intervals, if that, like if we even need to do that. Can you just by looking at this picture kind of intelligently figure out which pairs would we favor like as we're iterating through this maybe we have two choices between these two pairs which one do you think is better well the argument could be made this one starts first shouldn't we choose the pair that starts first because that might lead to a solution well it might but is there a guarantee? How do we know for sure? Well, the bottleneck is that the end of the pair has to come before any other pairs that we choose. So actually we realize that the bottleneck when we're choosing a pair to include in our chain is the ending value. The further the end value is, the fewer choices we're gonna have. Like maybe if this ending value was all the way over here, that'd be pretty nice because now now we can choose every interval that comes after this line over here. But now when we take that line and shift it all the way here, we have fewer choices. Like this guy tells us we can choose everything that comes to the right. But this guy tells us we can only choose everything that comes here. It's pretty obvious that this limits us a lot more than this one. That's not like a formal proof or anything, but it makes sense why we would now not choose based on the start value. We're going to choose intervals like among these two, we're 100% going to choose this interval. Now, it's possible that maybe this interval was actually moved over here. And in that case, it wouldn't matter because then this would form a chain. And if this interval was over here, then this could also form a chain. So it might be possible that either one of these would work. But in the case that they don't, and one of them is going to lead us to a solution, it's always going to be the one that ends earlier because now we can 
choose this one. If we were to choose the red one, we would not be able to include that in our chain. So if we're going to favor based on the smaller end values, we should probably sort them based on the end values as well. And then when we start iterating, our choices are very, very simple. We for sure are going to include the first interval. So like if I were to sort these, of course, this would be in the first position and I would include this for sure in our chain because there's no reason not to include it. We know every interval that comes after is just going to probably have a further to the right end value. So we include this in our chain. Then we go to the next interval based on like the end time. We're sorting based on the end time. So now that we've gotten rid of this one, we included it in the chain. Which of these two are we going to look at? Probably this guy. It ends earlier. So here, how do we know if we're allowed to include this in our chain? Like at this point, we're just being as greedy as possible. We want to try to include every single interval if we can. How do we know if we can include it? Well, that's where this comparison comes in. It's a very easy comparison to make. All we have to do is as we iterate through these pairs, we should probably maintain the length of our chain and also maintain the current ending value of our chain as well, which in this case is going to be three. And then when we add this guy, then our end value is now going to become five. And then we'll finally, now that we've eliminated these two, we're going to look at the third interval. It starts at one and that does not come after the end value of five. So we can't include this one in the result. So what we found is our length in this case was equal to two. All we had to do was sort the input and then scan through it. That is big O of n log n. Now let's code it up. So the first thing I'm going to do, as I mentioned, is sort the pairs based on the end time. Depending on the language you're using, you can probably provide some type of custom comparator. So in this case, I'm providing the comparison key, which is an inline function. That's what lambda means in this case, which accepts a parameter, which is the pair. And then it sorts it based on the second value in that pair. And like I mentioned, we're going to maintain the length of the chain. I usually call this result and I can do that, but I guess I'll just leave it as length because we're actually not going to need many variables in this case. Our code is going to be pretty short. We're always going to have a length of at least one because we're guaranteed to have at least one pair in the input. And we're always going to choose the first pair for reasons I mentioned a second ago. And if we're choosing the first pair, what's going to be the ending of our current chain? Probably the ending of the first pair. So we can get that like this first pair and getting the ending value of it. Now for I in range, we're going to skip the first pair. So we're starting at one and we're going to go up until the end of the pairs. And before I forget out here, we're going to return the length once we're done with this. But what do we do on the inside? Well, like I mentioned, how do we know if we can include this pair in our current chain? All we have to do is check if the beginning of that, so pairs of I at index zero, the beginning of that comes after the end of our current chain. We can't make this an equal. We have to make it like this. The ending of our current chain is less than the beginning of the next pair. In that case, we can increase the length of our current chain like this, and we can update the ending of our current chain like this. That is, believe it or not, the entire code. Not as bad as you would think. Definitely not as bad as writing out like a dynamic programming solution. Now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. I have some really, really cool features coming. I'm trying to finish them up today or tomorrow. And hopefully I'll see you soon.